All right, at the same time, there's some fascinating new analysis that we wanted to dig into for you about the way that non-white voters are basically voting more like white people. There is a uh, racial realignment that is occurring that is showing up increasingly frequently in the polls. There's a great Financial Times column with a bunch of associated charts that really broke this down. It was very interesting. Put this up on the screen, this first piece, and keep this up for a minute. Yeah. So this tracks that racial realignment, as I said, with non-white voters, especially non-college non-white voters, shifting away from Democrats and toward Republicans. So you can see that blue line is the Democratic share of those voters over time. And the red line is the Republican share of those voters over time. One thing, Sagar, that I noted about this particular chart mm -hmm. is you actually had some of this realignment occurring during the Bush years. Yes. There was a trend towards closing that gap. That ended and reversed under Obama, I think partly you know, because he was the first black president. And I do think that that forestalled something that was almost an inevitability, that as the memories of the civil rights era faded, that younger black and brown voters would vote more in line with what their actual political preferences are, meaning that previously you had a lot of conservative black and Latino voters who were nonetheless voting Democratic, even though the party was at odds with some of their especially socially cultural um, conservative positions. That's right. And now, with those memories of the civil rights era fading, they are beginning to vote more in line with what their actual political views and ideology, especially again on culture, really reflect. Well, I mean, the next graph, guys, if we could please put that up on the screen, really reflects what you're talking about. So for example, and this has been, I think, the biggest story. I've been trying to hammer this home now for years. White college educated voters are the ones who are swinging most towards Democrats. People who are boomers, 65 plus, also increasing. And just so everybody knows, this is not necessarily a bad thing for the Democratic Party because boomers and white college educated people, they love to vote. Now, white non-college educated, slightly moving Republican, Asian Americans slightly. Then you look at the overall age groups. There's been major swings, the biggest swings amongst the 18 to 29 demographic, amongst Hispanics, and specifically amongst black Americans. The black American swing away from Democrats is some net minus 25%. Again, I do not want to over state this, but uh, amongst younger blacks specifically and men as well, we are seeing increasing less identification with the Democratic Party. Now, will this, will these people vote? Maybe. Uh, statistically, probably not. Will this have a lasting impact on our politics? Yeah, I think so. And the reason why is because increasing non-party identification is now really the mainstream, Crystal. We mm -hmm. saw this previously where both the Democratic and Republican identification are near all-time lows. Independent is actually nearly double the individual party identification for both Democrats and for Republicans. So a lot of these black voters, Hispanic voters, I wouldn't call them Republicans per se in terms of a vote red no matter what or vote blue yeah. no matter who context. But I would say that they're up for grabs in a way that they have not been in a generation since the 1964 era, which really, you know, the whole Southern strategy and all that completely changed uh, the U.S. electoral map. And I think we're we're in the midst of that. Florida becoming a red state is a sign. Ohio becoming a red state is a sign. Georgia becoming a, a you know, a blue state. Arizona becoming, or at least a purple state, Arizona. Like our battleground maps from 20 years ago are totally different from the way that we, you and I are gonna be watching this election in 2024. Yeah, that is yeah. true. Put the next one up on the screen because this was really interesting to me. This is something I hadn't really thought of. But uh, this chart, the headline here says, we're used to the idea that young people lean more towards Democrats than the old, but the opposite is actually true of black Americans. The younger you are, if you are a black American, the less likely, likely you are to identify with the Democratic Party. Now, you'll notice that trend line for Republicans, it cinched up a yeah. little bit among young people, but it's more like you're saying, Sagar, they're not switching from Democrat to Republican. It's more that they're less of these diehard, partisan committed Democrats and more likely to be independents. And there is somewhat of an uptick among Republican support, although uh, based on this chart, it is relatively minimal. And, you know, I have to say, like, obviously, I'm no fan of the Republican Party, but I think it's 
I, I think it is a healthy thing for Democrats to reckon with the fact that they cannot take any demographic group of yes. their base for granted. Absolutely. Because the minute that, you know, you feel like, oh, well, they're just going to be with us. It really doesn't matter what, you know, what we do. The minute that that group is going to get absolutely none of their wishes and priorities met. So in that way, I actually think it's very healthy that you have this reassessment of, um, you know, the relationship with the Democratic Party. And it's more of like, OK, well, what have you done for me lately? And I hope that's what I hope and I wish. The next one, please. This, in my opinion, is like one of the most impactful graphs that you're ever going to see on American politics. For those who are just listening, it says that the income divide in U.S. politics is almost closed and the richest now favor Democrats over Republicans. It shows how the poorest third of Americans spiking in the year 1980, which makes sense, um, by, by a near plus 25 5% margin prefer Democrats, while the richest third at, again, a near 20% margin supported Republicans. Since then, the gap has roughly begun to narrow. It slightly went back to where things were in the Bush era. But from Obama really onwards, there has been a major swing of white college-educated Republicans who, of course, are going, or sorry, white college-educated uh, people who are, of course, going to disproportionately make up the richest third of Americans, swing in their democratic preference. A lot of this is culture, but a lot of this is four-year college degree. So while we can look at this in income, I really think it comes back to education, education, education. The poorest third of Americans increasingly becoming much more Republican over time. Let's be clear, they still do not prefer the Republicans on net, when part of this is why I still think the Democratic coalition is very strong. It's not only do they have a net preference uh, amongst the poorest third, but now they have all of these rich people who love to vote and they mm -hmm. have all of their interests, you know, that the Republican Party used to be very reliably, you know, have them come out to the ballot box while the middle third, middle class, slightly more Republican, but still net 50-50. And this comes back to uh, a big problem in the Republican Party. I mean, if people want to roll the tape and kind of look at what I used to say back four or five years ago, I'd be like, look, inevitably the Republican Party, like they have to service these new working class voters. But I don't think it's true. Uh, I do think that culture is frankly enough, you know, to get you to net 50. Yeah. Which if you can have billionaire donors and you can have white working class people vote for you, why wouldn't you do that? So, I mean, politically, the current strategy the obsession amongst Republican elites, Crystal, is we got to win back these suburban voters. It's not how do we service and further a lot of these new poorer Americans who support us change our views maybe on cutting entitlements or unions or, I mean, the minimum wage, all these other health care. They're all sorts of different issues. But this is kind of the trap. Now, if a smart man would say that they would adopt those and they would kind of accelerate that trend and make the richest people in the country Democrats so that you have the cultures, you know, you have the cultural capital and capital, actual like capital together, and then you can use like a populist revolution against them. But that's not really what's happening. I mean, we talk a lot yeah. about here. It's class Dealignment more That's than anything. Yeah. Uh, and I also think gender plays a huge role because uh, John Bur Byrne Murdoch, the guy who wrote this, he didn't put this in here, but he wrote a previous column, which I did a monologue here. Huge portions of what we're discussing amongst those black and Hispanic numbers, it's almost all men specifically black men. Like if you mm -hmm. if you break out the black men and Hispanic men, we're talking about like net 49, net 50 in actual ties in some of those groups. So it's gender, a lot of it is income, um, and most of it comes down to socio-cultural values. A lot of it is not really economic at this point. But well, yeah, yeah. and that makes sense because look, the parties do have differences on economics. There's no doubt about it. We were just showing Trump, you know, floating cuts to entitlements. This is a longtime Republican project. I think Democrats, even though they, in the past, not very recent, you know, quite recent past under Obama-Biden, they were also open to these cuts. You know, at this point, they're pretty locked in. They're not going to cut Social Security and Medicare. They're unlikely to improve Social Security and Medicare, but they uh, have really closed the door on cuts anytime soon. Mm -hmm. You know, you see this in the little things that the Biden administration administration has done, the little cut, you know, the little cuts to prescription drug prices, the going after junk fees. You see it significantly in terms of labor and antitrust in particular. So I don't want to minimize or erase that there are real differences between the parties. But 
We are also in an era where both parties are fully locked into the neoliberal economic paradigm. Yes. So in that way, yes, there are differences between them. Those differences matter. They're significant. But the overall economic paradigm is the same. And so it's not like you have two competing economic visions, which at another in another time period you know, during the New Deal era, you did have two mm-hmm. competing economic visions. And that's when you had, you know, significant class-based interest represented within the Democratic Party. So now many of the battles are around culture. And it's also, as we've talked about before, Sagar, in an era when, you know, people have little faith that either political party is going to be able to significantly deliver for them from a material perspective. The thing that it then makes sense for them to vote on is like, who's with me, you know, who's with my cultural tribe? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you see um, not a class realignment, which would indicate that, you know, working class people were all shifting towards one party, but a class dealignment, meaning that your income status is not really predictive anymore of which party you're going to affiliate with because, you know, it's more about those cultural interests than it is about those class or economic interests. I think that's a terrible state of affairs in terms of our politics, but I do think that's a reality of where we are and where we continue to head. We've been there for, you know, we've been here before. I like to think about history and kind of think about how this was resolved previously. So I think the most analogous political era to where we are right now is called the Age of Acrimony, which was the 1870s, the post-Reconstruction, Rutherford B. Hayes, like Mm. corrupt bargain, up until post-Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, where at that time, whether you were rich or poor in the South, you were voting for the Democrats because you hated black people and you wanted to preserve Jim Crow. And whether you were rich or poor in the North, you were voting Republican because you hated the South and your ancestors or your father or whatever fought against them in the Civil War. And yeah, you know, it turns out that we're aligned ourselves with the Vanderbilts, the Wideners and all these other rich people, but so be it, we got to resolve this question. Now, what a lot of people forget is we had some of the highest voting rates in the entire country at that time. Hmm. And the reason why is people really hated each other. I mean, the South, they hated the North and the North, they hated them right back. And they wanted to preserve at least some in Massachusetts and others, preserve rights for blacks and others. And there was also big questions around capital, which the South hated because they didn't have any and the infrastructure. But the way that we resolved that was the progressive era with Teddy Roosevelt and with Woodrow Wilson. The problem is we had to wait for a genius like Teddy Roosevelt to really come in and to completely flip the Republican coalition and lawmaking on their side. And he had to use his own personal will to actually change some of those questions, but he brought in a ton of new voters. And then Woodrow Wilson readopts this progressivism and actually changes the relationship of government to the people. But you know, don't get me wrong, it takes a long time. I mean, the the uh, era I just talked about was some 40 years of genuine insanity in the U.S. And uh, something we'll talk about later in the show is called the uh, the Peter Turchin uh, Mm -hmm. end of America thing. But what he really points to is that the Gilded Age is still the most analogous period to where we are right now. And uh, I have a personal fascination, you know, with that time period. But more and more I think about it, I I, I can't help but see not only the income parallels, but the the haughtiness and the arrogance of the American elite at that time. Time is so, exactly so like true. it is today. It's so just the same. And it took a first world war to destroy them. I mean, it took a long and, you know, a horrible and bloody war to actually change that consensus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the last thing that I'll say about these charts that I think everyone should uh, remember is that we can have these assumptions in politics that partisan identification and certain trends are just like immutable. Like they are what they are and it's just always gonna be that way, which is such a crazy way to think about politics when you consider like, it wasn't very long ago, West Virginia was a locked in democratic (laughs) state, right? right. And Colorado was like leaned Republican and was definitely up for grabs. Georgia was hard right, hard red, no Democrats stood a chance. Although if you go back a little bit further, Republicans didn't stand a chance. So. These things can't be taken for granted as just like, you know, that this trend is what it is and it's never going to change or that black voters are always going to 100 percent identify with the Democratic Party and going to be locked in. Things change and they shift and people are dynamic. They change their minds and, you know, different generations have different approaches to things. So if we could actually end by putting that first chart, A5, back on the screen, because there is one last thing I wanted to note about that first uh, chart. So a lot of the realignment, racial realignment that you see reflected in this chart 
where Republicans almost closed the gap, a lot of that is based on 2024 polling. So a lot of it, see, the very last mm -hmm. piece where they really come together, you see the trends prior to that, but a lot of it where they really come together is based on polls, not actual votes. And so that's going to be one of the big stories of this election cycle is whether or not this chart and the way it looks here comes anything close to reality or whether Democrats are able to stem the tide a bit. And I think the the difference in that is the you know the difference of who is going to be the next president of the United States right there. Yeah, no, you're you are absolutely right. The big, I mean, the big flashing red sign. I, and this is funny because I was tweeting about this a little bit yesterday. I had a couple of Democrats that I was chatting with, and they were like, "Hey, you can take all these you know non-voters that you want. These people is like, yeah, they may like you. They may have Instagram reels about they hate Democrats. They really going to come out to vote because our new white people, our rich white people, those people love voting more than." Than anything else, mm -hmm. and not, nothing gets them as jazzed up as a Planned Parenthood sticker on the back of their car. And I mean, I can make fun of them, but it's true. They vote, they vote their interests, and they organize. They have a lot of money, they have a lot of cultural capital. So I wouldn't bet against them either. I mean, those, you know, in a certain sense, like, you know, don't don't screw with suburban white women. Like they, they will come out, they will come out to vote more than anybody else. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded, we're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.